Today we're talking about pathological demand avoidance. Sponsored by Geldards, leading experts in special educational needs and disability law. Hi everyone, I'm delighted to have back with me today Libby Hill, who's an award-winning speech and language therapist. Now Libby's very, very well known for her work in the PDA field. Now for those who don't know what PDA is, Pathological Demand Avoidance, which is a presentation of autism. Um, but we still don't know that much about PDA. Um, and so I've invited Libby in today to talk to us a little bit more so that we can bust some myths and get to know that presentation a little bit better. So thank you, Libby, for coming in again. Pleasure. Um, so PDA is something I talk about a lot. We've done presentations and workshops on it. Um, but what is PDA? Well, currently it's seen as part of the autistic spectrum but it's quite different from typical autism. So Elizabeth Newson in the 1980s looked at some distinct characteristics that she felt children or young people with PDA presented with. And one of those is the ability to avoid even everyday demands. So they can be things like brushing your teeth, washing, changing your clothes. So things that you wouldn't necessarily see as a big thing but is still a demand. And they refuse to do that to a pathological level. So they could uh, make up all sorts of things. Oh, I can't do that because I broke my leg. Or I can't do that because I broke my toothbrush. Or yeah. I have broke my toothbrush. <laughs> um, so so, so the, the excuses and the reasons are, 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 are quite bizarre in, in some uh, ways. They will also refuse demands that there are their own demands. Okay. So things that they really want to do but they will refuse to do it. There are other things on there. So it's often a passive early history, so you weren't particularly worried. You just thought they were a little bit delayed or a little bit passive. Um, maybe their role play is fantastic. Mm. So it looks as if they've got really good pretend play, which wouldn't be a characteristic of autism, but it's a characteristic of, of PDA. Um, they have a really good surface sociability. So they look really sociable, so again, People think, well, that can't be autism because their social skills are just too good. And indeed, their social skills are sufficient to be able to manipulate people. And that's a key part of, of PDA. So that um, they will do all sorts of things to remain in charge. We have to remember that it's an anxiety-based <clears throat> disorder. Yeah. So most of it stems from, again, a, a trauma response. So not that they've been through... A huge trauma but every day yeah. can be traumatic so the fight flight or freeze they are fighting and they want the control they need the control to be able to um, as an anxiety anxiety response basically course, yeah. but the difficulty is there isn't um, one diagnostic tool that will say yes it's ASD with a PDA profile or no okay and it can some other things can mirror it. So attachment disorder can mirror PDA. Now Judy Eaton's actually standardising an assessment at the moment to be able to tell the two yeah. apart. She already looked at one with ASD and attachment, but now she's looking at PDA and attachment. We've got the characteristics that um, Elizabeth Newson uh, developed. We've also got the extreme demand avoidance questionnaire that Liz and Irons has put together. Yeah. But it isn't really a clinical tool that will say yes or no. So it's very hard. And partly because of that, it doesn't appear yet in the diagnostic manuals. So you won't find it in DSM-5 or ICD-11. And that makes a huge problem because many clinicians um, feel that they can't describe anything that they see that's not in those diagnostic manuals. Yes. So they will say, well, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Now, my response to that would be, I've got several houses that I would love you to spend the weekend yeah. at, <laughs> and you'll know it exists. Um, but there's a huge academic uh, debate, particularly some young academics who really feel that maybe they're moving towards the fact that, yes, it might exist, but they would see it as something separate to autism, yes. perhaps. Yeah. So our clinical knowledge at the moment is better advanced 
than the research. Not normally, it's the other way around. Yeah. So um, we met last January, January two thousand nineteen, um, and formed a research group. So there's lots and lots of research projects going on that will give us a much better idea. So, for instance, there seems to be a PDA personality. And so that, if we could define what that looks like, that would be another uh, part of yeah. looking at a PDA profile. So, so there's a lot going on, but right now you won't find it in the diagnostic manuals. No, so it makes it quite difficult for parents who are trying to get those needs understood yes. and met to actually achieve that. Hugely. Um, now, we often get asked by parents as well. Now, we don't agree with the high and low function and end of autism it's certainly not yeah. linear yeah. um but we know there are children and pe- well people in general who are autistic with no learning disabilities and then there are people with um w- who are autistic yeah. who have other things going on which affect their abilities and, and cognitive ability and everything else yeah. now with pda does it present with a certain type yes. of presentation in terms of autism yes mm. I mean, it, it's really interesting because if you talk to uh, Judy Eaton, she will say that, you know, you can tell PDA when they walk in the room, but they're usually, they're usually probably brighter than me because um, they, they, they are definitely, if we have to use those terms, they've got no learning dif- difficulties. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are, they're, they're the bright young people who are interested in lots of things. For instance, they're terribly interested in vocabulary. So their own vocabulary is probably fantastic, which almost gives them, uh, you know, a superiority. Yes, of course. So, yeah, it's it's yes. We we, if I get somebody who says, well, they've, they've, my child's got PDA, but they've also got learning difficulties, it probably isn't PDA, uh, and that would need further on picking. Yes, of course. Um, but it's all about the strategies that will help. So somebody who has got cognitive difficulties needs routine predictability, sameness. So what yeah. we would typically associate with uh, the the props or the supports that somebody who is autistic needs, whereas somebody with PDA likes novel. Yeah. They like different. They like new things and would get bored. So it's a tricky balance. Yes. Uh, but no, they're usually, they're usually able. Children. And can children, people, young people, you know, adults with PDA... Can they mask? Is that quite a similar thing to the sort of autism, the Asperger type of autism that we, yes. we're sort of quite familiar with? Yes. You <clears> will <throat> find that many children with PDA have masked to a certain extent at school. So the parents will be the first ones to notice that there's something going on and they're having terrible um, challenges at home, yeah. but they're not seeing it at school. Yeah. Uh, but there will become a point and sometimes that point is quite sad because sometimes that's the point where the child's actually broken Mm. but there will be a point where they can no longer do that at school and school will be seeing exactly what home is seeing and sometimes home have put the strategies in so there are lots of low arousal lots of choices Um, and so sometimes it calms down at home before it will then calm down at school which is always interesting that is interesting now, if um, a child or young person has PDA or parents are suspecting they have PDA, is there a pathway? What should they do next? Well, they need, um, they need an autism diagnosis because okay. at the moment, as I say, it's considered to be part of, of the autism spectrum. So they would need to uh, access a diagnosis, um, ideally with a clinician who has an open mind yeah. and who will look for that as a possibility so there are nhs clinicians who will have an open mind um, but there are others who will say absolutely not it doesn't exist we're still not allowed really to say it's pda so even if you go to the elizabeth newson center they will say asd with a profile of pda so as long as they're putting the demand avoidance part in there perhaps it doesn't matter too much as long as it's recognized and as long as you know that you need different strategies of course and in terms of those strategies um we know that obviously every human being is completely different yes and i think from my own experience we have to put extra consideration extra effort in 
to managing and helping a child or young person yeah. with PDA because we hear a lot from families they become disengaged very quickly and they're hard to get into those direct therapies which we know will help yes. them but of course there are those strong links with trauma and again it's not the car crash or abuse yeah. type of trauma but living each day day to day not understanding oneself yeah. the world not being accommodating to that particular person yeah. so what do we do what do we try and sort of aim for as parents as professionals in terms of trying to get that person involved with moving forward in their lives? Well, we, we call it low arousal strategies. So basically, we need to be regulated ourselves. Now, that's really hard. We, we, I'm just um, finishing off a, a book, Parental Perspectives of PDA, and it's been quite sad. It's actually been quite traumatic to, yeah. to collate, to listen to the stories from parents of what they go through. You know, people say parenting's hard. They haven't done, haven't seen anything compared to a PDA yes. parent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so your own regulation is really, really important. And then making sure that you see their behaviour, however awful it might be, mm. as like a panic attack. Okay. So it doesn't look like a panic attack. It looks like they're just calling you all the names under the sun and maybe yeah. they just hit you around the head. But <laughs> if you can bear in mind that that is a panic attack, you know, they can't help it. Um, but they need to feel that they have some control. So giving them choices yes, is, is a really good thing. Um, they do need to know what is coming up. Um, but if they can be allowed to, to, to choose that. But a feeling of being in control is the yeah. key. If you listen to uh, adults with PDA, that's the key thing. Respect us as we are and give us a feeling of control. And that that is the key. Whatever strategies you try um, will work, but they won't work all the time. And if they've worked once, they might not work the next time you use it. So don't give up hope with that. They're always worth going back to or trying again. Yeah. It's about having tools in your yeah. toolbox. Yeah. And the biggest tool is probably understanding and patience. Yeah. And I know that sounds airy-fairy, but we are talking about something that's very complex. Yes, of course. And one particular young person we work with with PDA has often said, everybody has to switch off their offended button. Oh, around yes. <laughs> and I think that's quite important because important. that reaction actually doesn't help does it you know if they're doing something that is quite offensive yes and that's one of their ways of manipulating is to either frighten somebody or shock them yeah and so you know i've lost i've lost count of the number of times you know i've been wanting them to do something and say did you know you're ugly (laughs) you know your teeth look like a rabbit i I can't i don't think there's anything that's ever been said but obviously you know i say yeah you know, then they realise they can't shock you anyway. or they'll say something you know I can't repeat some of the things that they've yeah, said because they think <laughs> that will shock me into stop me wanting them to do yes. you know what, what I'm going to get them to do so um, but yeah it's, it's I suppose a really tricky one it is tricky and I think it's, it's important and I'm sure you'll mirror um, and agree with what I'm saying here it's important that wherever that child is educationally whether that is a mainstream setting or a home education or specialist setting, they have to understand PDA. Completely. And that's the thing that we're trying to get written into EHCPs, whether it is for um, education other than school or home ed or whatever. Mm. The staff have got to be trained because they need to understand it. How can you deal with something if Mm. you don't understand it? It would be wrong, wouldn't it? Whatever field we were in. Um, So training of the staff is really, really important. Um, and it's it's a hard ask of a teacher and teachers will say well how can I do that for that young person but I'm not doing it for the rest yeah which is why it's a challenge a big challenge in mainstream school but we have to be seeing it really as adjustments for a disability or a difference because I think if a child and I know that you know one particular young person we work with will often say you wouldn't expect me to walk if I was in a wheelchair no. and I couldn't use my legs. Yeah. Yet I'm expected to talk and behave in a, in a neurotypical way yeah. that is just acting to me. Why can I not be my true self? Yes. You know, and it, it's so yeah. destroying to hear, really, as as parents, as as professionals, yeah. to know that 
children and young people are being told not to behave in the way that comes natural to them yes and there's a there's a you know a school of thought well well, actually we should be respecting them for how they are yeah which is why the understanding needs to develop because we need to understand that rather than it be well we're the adult they're the child we need to control this yes because we'll never win at games we can't win yeah uh you know so picking your battles is probably um the biggest tip I could give to anybody who yes. is working with somebody with PDA. And I think we have to pay, obviously, consideration. There's lots of speech and language needs, usually, with children yes. with PDA. Uh-huh. But they've also usually got quite a lot of sensory needs as well. Yes. And we need to understand what is sensory avoidance, which is, yes. you know, could be described as quite rational. But also, you know, when we're looking at PDA, a lot of people with PDA will say, well, actually, I don't like the word pathological, actually, because it is very rational. When you unpick the reasons why I cannot, not won't, but cannot do something, there are lots of reasons. I agree. And that's one of the bones of contention with some of the people who are against the term. Mm. They don't like the term pathological because medically that actually means more than just to an extreme. Um, but whether you call it extreme demand avoidance or pathological demand avoidance, whatever you call it, we still need to understand the reasons why. Yeah. And that's hugely important, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, we could go on and on about this topic. We could, we could. <laughs> We've both got lots to say about it. But I think what's important is to know that we have lots of workshops coming up. Um, please do look at our website because there is always something going on when it comes to autism and PDA with Sunshine Support. Um, come along to our workshops. Libby or one of her team members will be leading the workshops. And you will learn so much about PDA, but not only just the background of it, how to help day to day as well, which is so important, whether you're a professional or a parent. And again, with all our workshops, we encourage you to come together because that's where the magic happens if you can all be reading from the same page. So thank you again, Libby. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Um, And we hope to see you at one of our workshops soon.